Hello, all attendees. Hey, everybody. All right. <laughs> Nick. Oh, look at him. He's just... Here we he's are. He's just sucking up with all that. Middle English? <laughs> Old English. Old English, yeah. Old English. Yeah. Chaucer's Middle English, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's the one word you know. <laughs> Okay. I think we're good. I've got the stream going. I even remember to change the title. Well done. Okay. All right. Yeah, yes. It was, it was Marie. <laughs> Marie successfully guessed the one word of Anglo Saxon that, that, that Nick knows. <laughs> All right. I think we're ready to go. Okay. Here we go. Starting in three, two, one. Pausing for the convenience of the editors. Hello, and welcome back to this fast turnaround episode of the Silmarillion Film Project. I'm your co-host, Dave Kale, coming to you exactly a week after the previous episode, which is, like, incredibly surprising, apparently, to many of our in-person listeners who um, I think are probably going to show up next week. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, due, due, to some, due to some scheduling and, and prior engagements and stuff, uh, we, we had to come to you a, a, week, a week earlier than otherwise were originally scheduled to. And, uh, and then, of course, we're going to probably have a bit of an extended break for part of August. Yes. So sorry for the surprise. But for those of you who are anxiously awaiting sort of the, the continuation of our discussion about um, about the aftermath of uh, the battle, here it is. So, by the way, did let's... did you just say that the people that are listening to this on the podcast have just don't care what you about what you just said? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. it's it's not it's not bad to have the occasional reminder that this is also indeed a live show uh, yeah, for yes. people to attend, and anyone who is listening on the podcast is welcome to. Come in and join us if they but to remind uh, them was... on a week when we are normally not podcasting. <laughs> yeah, as was, as was pointed out on the on the the MythGuard um, uh, Twitter account, if you if you attend in person, I provide Lembus. Now the <laughs> ah the, yes. The fine print on that is you actually have to come in person in person in Los Angeles. So. Right. Sorry right. about that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Let me introduce my co-host, as always, Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and Trish Lambert, the Tolkien Maven. And in case are, you can't tell us all... apart, I'm Trish Lambert, the Tolkien Maven. Uh, excellent. Yeah. That's right. I'm the one that doesn't this have the beard. <laughs> yes. Right. And, it, and it's, of course, wonderful to get to talk to you guys twice within, within yeah. a week. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And the, continue, the only continue sad part of it means we're, we're now going to be talking, not talking for three weeks. Yeah, okay. then we'll have a long break. So, that, yeah. so you know, it's um, there's there's joy and then tragedy. <laughs> so we have to, we have to like, store <laughs> up. We have to store up. But then up consolation. The... But then there will be consolation. After Absolutely. That, so Absolutely. True. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm so, delighted to be back with you guys again tonight. So we've had a little change. We said last time uh, that we were going to do the last uh, uh, creative discussion where we we're going to talk about dragons and then do episodes 10 and 11. But we decided to shift. Um, and we're so we're going to do 10 and 11 now. And then we're going to do the dragons episode after our little uh, August hiatus here um, on August 22nd, which will be our next episode three weeks from today. So, um, so we're going to talk about episodes 10 and 11 today though actually first apparently we're not quite done discussing episode 9 as there are some issues concerning the battle that we need to address by popular demand uh, from our collaborators on the discussion board so um uh, we're, but just uh, one quick uh, announcement just about the regional moots that are coming up. We are getting towards fall moot season. So just a reminder, Minute Moot is happening in Amherst, Massachusetts on September 29th. We are finally getting New England moot together, and that is happening on September 29th. That is indeed a Sunday. We usually do them on Saturdays. This one's going to be on a Sunday afternoon uh, just because of venue scheduling issues. Um but we will be doing something on Saturday night there as well, uh, down in Amherst. But uh, so Central Massachusetts, September 29th, Minute Moot. And then we're going to be doing uh, Middle Moot, our third annual Middle Moot now uh, on August 12th out in Waterloo, Iowa. Um, 
So those are our next two moots coming up. Look for some information about, hopefully, Magnolia Moot and also Bay Moot out in the San Francisco Bay Area um, for later in the fall. So we're working on those two as well, and we will have further announcements about that stuff as we move forward. Um, anyway, so that's uh, the, 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 those are the things that are coming up to be thinking about. Now, so, okay, so there are two related issues that have been raised, or protests, perhaps, I don't know. Um, one is that the, the, there was some um, disquiet with our uh, desire to have Balrogs uh, at, the, uh, at the battle. And in retrospect, thinking about how our discussion went last time, the objection was raised... You know, when we started casually tossing out the fact that we wanted Balrogs at the Dagor Aglarab, people were like, oh no, but if you do that, you'll have to kill off a named character. And so I think that was perhaps an attempt to dissuade us from having Balrogs in the battle, but of course instead, <laughs> we, that argument kind of backfired on people and we then blithely we're like, decided okay. that we're going <laughs> to kill off Angrod in the battle. Uh, so thus kind of making the situation worse rather than better perhaps, from the point of view um, of the people who are having uh, problems with this. So uh, let me um, let me read through the, the points uh, that they're making here, and then we'll, we'll... So we'll start with the Balrog issue, and then we'll move on uh, specifically to the question of Angrod's uh, death um, and whether or not we're going to uh, uh, listen to the, uh, the, 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 the clamor uh, uh, for mercy to be shown towards Angrod and for him to be spared yet a while. Uh, to... Spoiler alert, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, okay. <laughs> so, the Dagor Aglarev, so I'll, I'll just read this. The Dagor Aglarev is meant to be a successful battle for the elves with few casualties, giving them a sense of confidence. Okay. The inclusion of Balrogs and the death of Angrod muddies the distinction between this battle and the tragedy of the Dagor Bragalach. The scale and the dragon may not be enough to distinguish these battles for the audience. Can Morgoth be revealed at the end to be testing the strength of the elves, holding the Balrogs in reserve in case the Valar retaliate for his actions here? Okay. So, um, first thing that I would point out in general, um, some people have been saying, but like, wait a second, like, why would we add Balrogs to the Dagor Aglareb when the Balrogs didn't come out until the Dagor Bragalach in the text? The first thing I would emphasize about that is we, we do not have the authority of the text on that question at all. It is true that the Balrogs are not mentioned in the Dagor Aglareb, and they are mentioned in the Dagor Bragalach. But I would also remind you that the description of the Dagor Bragalach is like <laughs> one paragraph long in the published <laughs> Silmarillion. Um, th this is like, I, I mean, no, they're not mentioned. That does not at all su uh, suggest that Tolkien was like, a hot, was like saying there were definitely no Balrogs at the Dagor Aglareb. They're just not mentioned. As are like a whole bunch of things not mentioned. It's super, super short. The published Silmarillion is very, it's like the plot summary genre that, that uh, you know, Tolkien was, was working with and began working with back in 1928. So anyway, like the, the mere absence of something like that from the text, um, like the mere failure to mention it, is in no, so like to, to draw from that the conclusion that, you know, like the Tolkien canon is that there are no Balrogs at the Dagor Aglareb. That's a that's a that's a I, that is a false conclusion that I that I protest against on literary grounds. Um, again, so I mean, it, it would have to be a much more forceful negative for me. And if there were a forceful negative, that is, if Tolkien were saying that Balrogs did not go out, I'd have to have a reason for why. I, I would expect him to give a reason for why the Balrogs didn't go out. And this is my biggest problem still. And we talked about this some last week. It's still my biggest problem with the Balrogs not going out is that um, it seems to me just to create problem after problem after problem, honestly. Like there are two, di like it creates problems on, for, and, and, and by problems, I mean problems from, for our story, for like the story that we're presenting to our readers. It undermines Morgoth, and it undermines the elves at the same time, right? Let me explain what I mean by that. It undermines Morgoth by making him look, I think, kind of foolish. Like, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to throw away all of my armies of orcs. I'm not saying that he cares so much about his orcs that he's not going to waste them, right? Um, but 
the like I'm not I mean but but why get why hold back the Balrogs? He wants the elves to take this seriously. He wants this to be a major battle. He he's so like so he has no attempt to he's making no attempt to win at all, right? Okay, if that's the case, then the elves are fools for believing it, right? I mean, if they in fact gain overconfidence by being suckered in by Morgoth putting forth what they know to be not his full strength. They have seen the Balrogs in battle before. They've seen even the trolls in battle before. And so here's all of the elvish armies, right? And the the orcs charge out by themselves and nobody, not one person is like, huh, no trolls. Ah, uh, no Balrogs either. I, anybody else feel like Morgoth is kind of sandbagging this one, right? I mean, like nobody yeah. is going to be thinking that. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I just, it, well, the other, the other one for me is, uh, it's kind of like what you're saying and it has more to do with the story we've been building. And I think back to when we were in Valinor, I mean, the Balrogs, we have built the Balrogs up in this story to be the cat, his captains. Yes. They're his captains. There's they captains are the leaders of his armies. Yes. 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 So to have. That we've done that in our story, and then the very first battle, they don't go out. Our story also is, is that's not consistent with what we've been leading up to. So it's gonna I, look weird. I mean, I, yeah, I would think we could expect our viewers to be like, "What the heck? Where are the Balrogs?" Right? Um, and again, and that's what leads me to think, if if the elves are all like, "Well, boys, we took." Morgoth's best shot, and we are, he's never going to be, this is proven, right? It's, it's definite. He can't possibly beat us, right? Look what we did, right? We took his best shot, and it didn't phase us, right? And all the viewers are going to be like, dudes, like the Balrogs weren't even there. Exactly. Right? He's obviously not trying. I mean, it's going to make them look gonna start dumb. The script writers. Yeah, well, so well, Nick Balrogs. It's true that Balrogs are non-renewable resources, but no, there have been. There's never been a Balrog death yet, you know. So it's not like they're exactly at risk either. Um, I mean, has in, have we killed a Balrog yet? I don't remember no, no, no. of killing a Balrog yet. Uh, so I, I mean, again, like so, the, the very idea that a Balrog is killable is not even something that's been yet proven to anyone, to our viewers or to the elves, right? So, and, and like, is Morgoth seriously going to, like, he's going to be like, I don't want to send out the Balrogs in case they get hurt? Like, really? Like, that's, that's, just, that's not, that's not winning thinking, right? If that's how you're, if that's how you're going about it. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, well, in the War of the Powers, yeah. So some of the Balrogs might have been killed by, like, Orome and Tolkas during the, uh, you know, at the end of Season 1. Um, but barring that, um, and again, the whole, the whole, um, um, the whole deal with... Yeah, so, exactly, Marie. The text says that Morgoth made trial of his strength in the Dagor Aglareb. That suggests, that very phrase, made trial of his strength suggests to me that he is trying his own strength. Like he thinks the, the army that he's sending out has a decent chance of winning and he discovers otherwise. And he's not totally, you know, it's not like he's crushed by this. It's not like Morgoth goes into this cycle of depression after the Dagor Aglareb, right? It's fine. Orcs are a renewable resource and he builds more and, and goes back to the R and D department. Right. But the very concept that he's making, that doesn't mean it's all a feint, right? That it's, that he's faking, the thing and merely just trying to lure the elves apparently by this reasoning if we follow this the non balrog rationale successfully suckering the elves into believing that the they are stronger than they are relative to morgoth and i just i have a hard time getting behind that i have a really hard time getting behind that without making the elves look you know again make make, make them look dumb um so I, 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 I mean, I, what Nick is saying that that suggests to him that he's not fully committed to the attack. I, I don't think that the Morgoth making trial of something comes close to him thinking, oh, it's okay if we don't win. I mean, right. I, he's, trying he's to not going to send his troops out. Yeah. I mean, he's still in it to win it. Yes, Even I think he's, he's still trial. here to win it. I don't think that this battle is just a fake. Um, yeah. It's less than the Dagor Braglock. But again, the moral is, he learns, okay, this wasn't enough, right? 
thought this might be enough. Turns out they're a little more competent than I thought, right? This didn't pan out the way that I thought. Uh, so next time, I'm going to... Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna yeah, up I my game. I right. could compromise here, and maybe not all the Balrogs go to this battle. Maybe for some reason Gothmog or somebody decides we're not gonna send all the Balrogs out. We're gonna send Joe and Sid. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, why would you send Joe and Sid? <laughs> By sending Joe and Sid, you're just begging the question by sending the two loser Balrogs out into the... And tell them to put their red shirts on, just in case. (laughs) Right. Um, Sid is definitely Durin Spain, Nick says. (laughs) Sid is Durin Spain, exactly, yeah. Uh Uh-oh, we're in trouble. I like it. I like it. Absolutely. Durin Spain is down there like, I got no respect in the first age, but I am the man in the third age. <laughs> don't call me Sid. It's no one's calling me Sid anymore. Uh, we have had about enough of that. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, okay, but here, here's, here's the other thing. Um, personal protection like so back to the question of if we don't send the balrogs what are they doing right right and i'm just the idea that morgoth feels that he needs them for personal protection i mean the idea that he needs them for personal protection against the 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 uh the valar like how'd that work out for him last time right i mean like that's that's not a, a winning strategy either right i mean if if you know, Aonwe, or if, if Aonwe, but I mean, if like Orome and Tolkis come back over, right, and Aonwe come back over, like, okay, the Balrogs is not going to matter, right? Um, It's not going to really move the needle, and he's got to know that. They were there the first time when he was captured. So, um, I, and I mean, I also they, don't see Balrogs as defensive as much as offensive. No, I mean, I can imagine, an, uh, you know, a, a Balrog guarding a gate, you know, like sort of standing okay. there in a gate. Yeah. Like, I, 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 it's not that, I mean, that, that can certainly be a, a very striking visible, or, you know, visual um, right. uh, uh, image, I think. Um, but but still, yeah, I mean, it's, but guarding Angband against what, uh, Marie? If they're guarding Angband against what, like a counterattack? Um, he's put forth enough force to, you know, um, certainly get the attention of all of the, like, it's going to take the combined armies of the elves to beat them. And they do. Right. And, and again, we still have the Dagor Aglareb being a resounding victory for the elves. Um, it is a resounding victory. And again, it's only on, you know, the one front instead of, and it's, you know, it's, so it's, 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 it's going to look very different. Um, but, but anyway, sorry, getting back to the Balrog question. The question of what they do, I mean. Um, I just... I want to avoid making Morgoth or the elves look, either of them, weak or stupid. Right? Weak or stupid or foolish. Right? I don't, I don't, want, I don't want either side to end up looking weak, stupid, or foolish by what we choose to do in this battle. And that's the entire reason I was saying last time, like, why on earth wouldn't the Balrogs go? If he keeps them in because he's like, I need, you know, I'm going to huddle behind the Balrogs for protection. I mean, he doesn't need the Balrogs. As we will see when he does, in fact, fight Fingolfin, it's not exactly a fair fight, right? I mean, he can go toe to toe. Seriously, what are they going to do? Sneak in and overpower him? Uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, so he's not, he's not himself under threat. He's not afraid other than of the Valar. And then again, Balrog's not much help against the, you know, the entire force of the, uh, of the, you know, the United force of the Valar uh, descending upon him. So certainly the United force of the Valar descending upon him is a major concern of Morgoth's. Um, but uh, again, that, you know, keeping a handful of Balrog's at his side, not likely to really move the needle there. Um, so, Arguably, his best strategy r- with respect to the, the Valar is wipe the elves out as fast as possible. So that, so, so so that they're sort can... of like before anyone can really notice. And they're not and, – and, you know, it's a fair assumption that the yes. Valar probably aren't, aren't paying that close of attention yet. Mm-hmm. 
So mm -hmm. sure. I mean, and yeah, I agree. I mean, if he's going to, and, and we see, in fact, he does this, right? What does, when Morgoth succeeds in basically stamping out all of Beleriand, right? I mean, and in, in, in the final stages of the first age, after the fall of Gondolin, after the fall of Nargothrond, after the fall of Doriath, right? He's pretty much won. I mean, he's now totally overrun 98% of the continent, right? What does he do? Stock starts building up and stockpiling armies to defend himself against the Valar, which, like, when the War of Wrath comes, he's pretty well prepared for it, right? And it's actually, like, a sort of a challenging battle, and I'm going to be really interested to do that one when we get there. But, um, and even, like, the Winged Dragons come out, right? And, like, it's, like, touch and go for a little while there until Arendel shows up. So... You know, there's, there's, in other words, Dave, I'm agreeing with you here, right? What does he do as soon as he wins, as soon as he does conquer the elves? He says, okay, I'm going to build up an armament to defend myself against the Valar, right? The elves are in that sense like a nuisance, a distraction um, uh, from him defending himself against the Valar. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, I just uh, I, I'm just I'm just thinking about his his sort of strategy here. Now, Rhiannon, I I like th that's a really interesting idea. The idea that like while the when the armies go out, there's like a slave rebellion in Angband. I, I, I'm interested in that idea, especially as a way to sort of show uh, to give a glimpse into the lives of the captives there. But there are a couple problems there. Number one, there aren't that many captives yet, right? We've only just started capturing folks, so until the battle, like even Rog isn't there yet. Right. Um, cause he's not going to get there. Uh, and again, I know we've changed his name. I'm going to carry on calling him Rog, just FYI. Um, Rog isn't there yet. So, um, uh, you know, I, anyway, so like, you know, our like, uh, you know, primary elf captives aren't, uh, aren't even present yet. Right. And secondly, Balrogs to restrain a slave rebellion is like massive overkill. Like orcs can do that. Right. Um, I really don't know that we need. Um, uh, I really don't know that we need a, like the whole, all of the Balrogs in arms uh, to keep the slaves down. One Balrog would be sufficient to keep the slaves. Morgoth himself would be enough, right? I mean, like the 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 slaves start rebelling and Morgoth and Sauron come in, right? Um, you know, Sauron with like uh, Draugluin and. Uh, uh, you know, and Morgoth himself shows up and Thurin Gwethil and like, it's done. Right. And, you know, and, and, and yeah. So I just, I'm, uh, in the end, it doesn't feel to me like a satisfactory explanation for what the Balrogs are needed for back home. Um, so I don't think Morgoth is going to be actually half-hearted about this. And yes, there is a long piece after, um, the Dagor Aglareb because Morgoth needs to be building up his armies and he's not just replenish, you know, re re replenishing the armies that were depleted in the Dagor Aglareb, he's building them up way past that, right? So that the next attack, because he now knows I need to, I need to dial it up a lot for the next attack if I expect that, if, if I want the kind of overwhelming assault that I was really kind of hoping for, right? So, um, I... Uh, Anyway, yeah, so, so so that's why there's a long piece. If he was faking it the whole time, if he was just feigning to attack, feigning that this was, you know, just putting out enough orcs to make the elves take it seriously and to try to make them overconfident, he would not have committed so many of his forces that there was a long piece afterwards while he built up, you know, more orcs. Like, that's not how, that would be, again, that would be foolish, foolish of him to do that. Why would he do that? Um, I, I just, it makes me feel like that. It just, it, to me, that, that it feels like it diminishes Morgoth. And I know like there are other tasks we could imagine sending the Balrogs to, like we could imagine sending them off to the East. Like maybe there's something they need to be doing with the men in Hildorian or something like that. I'm not saying we can't imagine up any jobs for them. But I'm still saying no matter what jobs we send them to, unless it's like a really, really good excuse, it's still not going to be less weird 
for Morgoth to be well, like... Well, we batted that around last week, and we said, why would he do that? If he knows he's planning for this battle, why yeah, would he send this is a major offensive, anywhere? but I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not yeah. engage my best I'm gonna troops because I don't I'm gonna send the captains of win. my armies, yeah, yeah, off to the east. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I just, uh, um, so this is why I'm, I, these are these are the reasons why it feels to me like there there's no and and also getting back to the other point about the Dagor Bragalock, um, I do not believe that the inclusion of Balrogs is the distinguishing element or even really a primary distinguishing element between the two. And nor do I think that the that the presence of Balrogs in both places is going to make the two battles look indistinguishable. Um, the vast hordes of orcs, the far vaster hordes of orcs and 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 you know and the in with the fire, right, in Glaurung attacking on multiple force in overwhelming numbers and the sweeping flames, that those are the things that are going to make it look different, right? And it's going to be devastating and catastrophic because the both the flames and then like the massive armies of orcs on every single front um, uh, all the way across the entire Northlands. I mean, here the elves are like, we've got him ringed in, right? There's no chink in our defenses through which he can escape. And what's his response to that? Not to find a chink through which he can escape. Instead, he's just like, boom, I'm going to take out every single, I'm going to attack and conquer almost every single point in your entire defensive ring at once. That's his response. So again, what do we see? What is Morgoth's military tendency. His military tendency is towards overwhelming force. And this is why, again, I can't see him withholding the Balrogs just because he kind of wants to. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and Nick, exactly. I know that we changed the multiple fronts thing for the Dagor Aglareb in order to make the two battles look less similar. Exactly. Uh, and, I, you know, again, I think that many of the changes, especially the ones that we introduced like that, are going to... Uh, the, the mere fact that Balrogs happen to be fighting in both, you know, because, again, that's going to be a standard thing. Like, um, do we want the good guys to be going into battle and being like, phew, well, at least there aren't any Balrogs, right? I mean, when you're facing the armies of Morgoth in battle, you kind of got to expect Balrogs, right? I mean, that kind of comes with the package, doesn't it? And and for them to, I mean, I get, and, and none of them are going to be like, oh, well, gosh, I wonder why, you know, he didn't send any Balrogs. That's a little odd. Um, anyway, so... Um, but see, but Nick, there's no precedent for them being surrounded and killed. No, we wouldn't want the Balrogs to be surrounded and killed. But as that's never happened before, and indeed doesn't happen in the Dagor Aglareb either, then like, why would he be worried about it? Uh, I mean, it, it needs to happen at least once before there can be any concern that it might happen again. And anyway, again, like if the Balrogs are your absolutely strongest offensive weapons, like if they're so fragile that you're afraid they're going to get destroyed and so you keep them and don't use them for fear of us, they get destroyed again, like that's a losing strategy like that's being a bad military commander i'm not going to put out my strongest troops just in case they get hurt um and what would you be saving them for like i know oh, well, exactly okay, I don't wanna, that's, you know, like, that's for what? yes that's exactly why it's a it's a it's a really bad uh it, it's a really bad tactic um so anyway um i yeah yeah now rihanna and i agree with you um they haven't seen many Balrogs before. Like you know, most of the most of the, the the elves who are fighting in this battle will not have faced Balrogs before. The Feanorians saw the Balrogs in battle, um, but uh, uh, but that's but I mean I doubt they've kept that to themselves, right? I mean the elves. Will I was going to say I'm sure the they would at least know about them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, if if the result is everyone's like, I've heard stories about the Balrogs, the like the, the the Balrogs killed Feanor, right? I mean, like that's even if not for any kind of like objective power they have, they have they will have massive street cred, right, among the elves because they killed Feanor. Everybody knew, right? You know, there were lots of people who were not you know super pleased with Feanor, but everybody knew you know, that he was kind of a big deal, right? Um, you know, he was the best and strongest of them, and everybody knows that. Um, uh, 
Uh, so either, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it seems like if somebody, if you, if the Bal- Balrogs weren't in the battle, it seems like we'd have to have somebody say afterwards while everybody's going cheering and everybody, everybody goes, yeah, but you know, the Balrogs weren't in the battle. Exactly. So don't get all excited. Which totally <laughs> yeah. undermines the point of the battle. Like again, right. they, which brings me back to if the elves are overconfident after the the Balrog free battle, then they're foolish. Um, and the viewers will see them as being foolish. And certainly Mithros, come on, Mythros, Mythros is going to be at the, and be oh, like, yeah. I mean, sh- surely, I mean, because yeah. Mythros is going to be there. He's going to arrive at the end of the battle in the way we were drawing up the tactics right. last time. He's going to be like, no trolls, no Balrogs. This was a cakewalk, right? This is not, you know, he's surely yeah. going to be the first one who's going to say, yes, don't be yeah. too impressed with yourselves. So he's going to be a super strong voice against overconfidence. I just, um, Okay, now do Angrod. Okay, now do Angrod. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk about yeah. Let's talk about the death of Angrod. So, the death of Angrod. Um, uh, I, I was about to say part of me would really like to spare Angrod, except I'm not actually sure that's true. Uh, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty happy to kill Angrod off. I know that Angrod is killed off in the text in the Dagor Bragalock. I know this. Um, I have to admit, though, that I... Um, uh, I <laughs> Nick, you're still... I still don't understand why you think the Balrogs are so fragile, Nick. I really don't. Like, the Balrogs have so many hit points, it's not even funny. I mean, remember, it is going to look like a miracle the first time a Balrog is killed. We are going... We've made the decision to go with big Balrogs, right? To go with the 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 the, the later version of the Balrogs, not the... You know, the Balrogs were like shock troops in the first... Like, way back in the Book of Lost Tales, right? You know, two are killed how many Balrogs single-handedly uh, in the Book of Lost Tales version of the of the Fall of Gondolin? I mean, like, you know, he had, like, a whole bunch of, um, um, of, of, of Balrog notches on his axe. But we decided we're not going there, right? The, the Balrogs are going to be few in number and a huge big deal. We're not going to have any... I mean, when is our first, first Balrog death scheduled? Is it before Gondolin? Are we going to kill off a Balrog prior to Gondolin? I think that Ixthelion might get the first Balrog kill yeah. ever. And I would think that's what we want to do. We'd want to have that yeah. be like a miracle. Like, oh my God, exactly. he killed him. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. Bal- so, so like, the, the, the when Ixthelion kills Gothmog without the use of either one of his arms, which we are totally keeping in our version, needless to say, um, like, I, it's going it, to it's gonna be like a miracle. And then Glorfindel... It's going to be you catastrophic. Yes, That's what it's absolutely you catastrophic. Um, uh, so... Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am not... Prepared. So, so again, the Balrog should look anything but fragile. It's going to be... It's still going to be years before any Balrog is even in danger in battle, really. Um, I mean, the closest a Balrog has ever come to death will have been when Feanor was fighting them, which wasn't particularly close to death because Feanor was was outnumbered. Um, uh, so anyway, it's, it's just... Uh, I, yeah, okay. Angrod. So, there are two reasons to not kill Angrod. And that would be if either A, we still really have something that we want him to do uh, between now and when he is scheduled in the books to die, namely uh, the Dagor Bragalach, or if um, there's a, like, there's a, 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 there are some good reasons for, if his death will do more, will, will, will serve us better, right? Will serve the story better if it happens in the Dagor Bragalach than if it happens here. Those would be, to me, the two reasons to spare poor Angrod's life. I mean, I should say give him a brief reprieve, because, of course, we're talking about, we're talking about, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think that our plan to kill off Angrod is, is, is frankly, the more merciful one. It is the most merciful, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you I know, mean, imagine him living after finding yes. out about his wife. Yes, after his wife's you treachery know. and death, like yeah, well he yeah. so no, we're just gonna have him live with that for a little while and then die. 
<laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So, like, again, not not sure uh, that it's uh, uh, that it's that it's doing him any favors. Um, so, okay, I agree in that sense. It's more tragic, Murray. I agree, in it. and and simply max for for the purposes of maximizing tragedy and making everyone as miserable as possible. It is conceivable that we could we could achieve that end better by keeping him alive. But, um, um, so okay, um, I hey Nick, I agree with you. I would like to stop this to point out that I agree with Nick Palazzo on the point that he just made. Um, sorry, Nick, I'm teasing you. Uh, but uh, Nick says he doesn't think that keeping him around is all that important. Um, I agree, I agree. And here's 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 the problem. I really so. Uh, Rihanna and I read in particular your arguments uh, for keeping Engrod alive, and I really, I really like them. And Marie sort of told me that there were a bunch, and and I went and I you know and I I read them, and I I, re I really wanted to agree with you, but I, I I can't. In the end, I don't think I can because here here's my problem. I actually <laughs> think that, um, I actually think that Engrod's earlier death serves the narrative much, much better. It's not just that I don't think we lose much. I think we gain a whole lot. And here's the number one thing that we gain. To this point, in you know, episode 10 of season 4, tell me something about Ignor's character. What's he like? How many lines has he had? Who's he? I mean, he's been... We've had, we've had a lot more Angrod, haven't we? Way more Angrod. Ignor has been like Sir Barely appearing in this film to this point, right? And I, I'm not criticizing that. I'm not saying that we've we've done badly in doing that. We always have to choose who gets the right. lines, right? You know, we can't, like, you know, it's not like right. an equal opportunity thing. Um, we did do that on purpose, exactly. But the time is coming, Right when I got to clear the deck. Yeah, 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 exactly. So even if 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 Angrod's untimely demise serves no other function other than to clear the deck and uh, and and give Ignor some time in the sun, I mean, hey, look, he's um, if Angrod uh, and Ethelos both die in this battle, then here's Ignor left alone in Darthonian, right? Um, dealing with the you know the the horrible tragedy of like what was done you know the victimization of his sister-in-law and the tragic death of his brother um and the, and so so he begins the story with um with Andreth in like an emotionally complex and interesting um uh situation right um if Angrod is still alive he is still second fiddle right just second fiddle, right? Um, and I and I I would like him to be able to step into the spotlight before um, uh, before we uh, are gonna because he is going to be one of the central characters of season five. I mean, the story of Ignor, I, I in my mind, the death of Ignor is. I think that we can use the death of Ignor as. Like the embodiment, like this, uh, like the symbol of the tragedy of the Dagor Bragalak, right? Um, the death of of like the the outlawry of Barahir and his band, right? Afterwards, is also kind of part of that. But like the the horrible death of the, our romantic lead, right? Our number one romantic uh, male lead uh, from season five in the Dagor Bragalak is you know, and the 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 tragedy in which that is wrapped up in from like before the battle even and you know his so so yeah it's all like he his death is going to be the central moment and as far as i'm concerned like the central moment of like the viewer's tragedy the viewer's sense of the tragedy of the dagor bragalak point we have a long ways to go to build ignore to the point where he's going to be that guy right uh, now we've got time to do it. We've got all of season five in which to develop him, and that's fine. We've developed like Celeborn almost from scratch in this season, and that's cool. We've got plenty of time to do that. But again, in my mind, Angrod being out of the way makes that easier, not harder. Um, it is true that we won't have... Um, uh, it's true that we won't have uh, Angrod around 
for Ignor to talk to anymore, but he can have other folks to talk to. He's not and also to um, Stephen and Rhiannon have both uh, brought up the point that having Agnor Angrod die in Aglareb will will it affect Fingolfin's feel of loss after the Bragalock. But I I don't know that that's I mean it seems to me like there's other things we can do. I don't know. I mean yeah. I don't know if that's yeah no ex fixable. so here here's the thing there. Um Fingolfin despairs. Uh, but I'm very resistant to the idea that his despair stems principally or even largely from the death of Angrod and Ignor. I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't care about the death of Angrod and Ignor, but I don't think it is the death of those two nephews of his that is what pushes him over the edge, right? I mean, all of his sons are still alive. Right? He hasn't lost any children. Yes, he lost two of his nephews, and that's very sad, right? But that's not what leads him to despair in the future of his house, right? The fact that two out of his three nephews, you know, two out of, you know, are dead, right? That's, I mean, again, it's sad, but that's not, that's not the factor here, right? His despair isn't based on the death of Angrod and Ignor. Again, doubt, it's certainly tragic, right? But it isn't. But I, I don't think that that's um, the, uh, the the central part. I mean, I, to, to, to me, that seems like a, a pretty significant miss. I mean, if 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 I were if I were fingin, I, I'd have to admit I'd feel a little bit miffed about that. Right. You know, I mean, if if Fingolfin is, I mean, Fingin is like right there. Right. His son is like right there. His oldest son is right there. And Fingolfin is like, my two nephews are dead. My house is doomed. There should be nobody to take over after me. And Fingen's like, dude, I'm right here. Like, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, so is Turgon. We're good. Right. And are though? And I mean, like, okay, you know, so I just, um, I, 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 you know, okay, yes, Murray Turgon isn't around because he's locked in Gondolin, but like, they're not gonna, I don't think they're gonna be thinking that he's, anyway, I'm just saying, um, that the th the despair of Fingolfin, what I what I what I you know what I would argue is the source of the despair of Fingolfin. He is the number one person who believes that like they know they can't defeat Morgoth. They know they can't de kill him, right? That they're not gonna like conquer Angband and cast down Morgoth and slay him, right? They know that they're not gonna be able to do. That. I don't think anyone is living under any delusions that they're going to be capable of accomplishing that. I don't think so. Um, and I certainly don't think that Fingolfin thinks that. If anybody does, I don't think it's him. Um, uh, maybe, but I really don't think so. Um, but he's going to be the main one who is saying, like, our job, like, our role here is to hold him in leaguer, right? We can set up a defensive perimeter to be a buffer. Like, we shall provide a buffer between Morgoth and the entire rest of Middle-earth, right? We are serving Middle-earth. We are, we are, we are, we have, we have, uh, um, by setting up the defenses that we have set up, we are quarantining Morgoth from the rest of Middle-earth, right? You can thank us later, guys. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, I, but that's what crumbles, right? The Dagor Bragalock proves beyond a doubt that they anyone who believed that was completely wrong, right? He does believe. After the Dagor Aglareb, he does believe that they can win because they feel like they've taken his Morgoth's best shot and they want, by working together, right, and by the unexpected to Morgoth, uh, successful uh, uh, combination of their forces, they won, right? And they won resoundingly. And it didn't come at no cost, right? When 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 do battles ever come at no cost? Or do we really want to have a no cost battle with like very few casualties, where the elves are like, "Well, that was easy, right? Um, let's do it again tomorrow." Like, I don't think that's how we wanted to pick battle ever, frankly. Um, uh, but anyhow, um, so so they're like, "Okay, like we were sweating there for a few minutes, but you know, um, we." Uh, um, we totally won there. So I think we can do this. It's going to be tough, but we can do this. And then at the Dagor Bragalock, he's like, 
it's all it's it was all a fantasy. We can't do this. Um, the force of the enemy is overwhelming. We are all gonna. We have been divided. Dorthonian has fallen. We can't like our strength was in our ability to combine. This is what uh, uh, Fingolfin primarily, Finrod secondarily are going to be arguing. Right? We need to work together. This is our season four thing, and uh, and at the end of season five, Fingolfin is going to be like, it can't happen now. There's no hope. Um, uh, that's his despair. Like his despair is of them ever succeeding. Morgoth has separated them, and he's gonna pick them off now one by one. Um, now, Nick, does Mithros seriously think he might get the Silmarils back? Maybe. I am willing to believe that one or more of the Feanorians think that they can win. Maybe it's Mithros. I'm not sure it's Mithros. But I don't think it's Fingolfin. I really don't. Um, but, um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, but now, Rhiannon and I agree that Angrod's death in the Dagor Bragalock could be used. We could use his death in the Dagor Bragalock to demonstrate the prowess of the fully go- grown Glaurog. We can also use the death of Ignor to demonstrate the prowess of the fully grown <laughs> Glaurog. I mean, we have a major character who definitely needs to be killed in the Dagor Bragalock in Ignor. Um, and again, I don't know that um, uh, saving Ang- and but then there's all the benefit that we reap from killing off Angrod early, right? The orphaning in one stroke of Orodreth, um, which was my favorite bit because oh, yeah. I didn't even anticipate yeah. that. And I love that bit. Maybe, or how about this? How about this? What if Orodreth is taken in first by Ignor, right? I was thinking that too. What if he's taken by Ignor? Now we have somebody for Ignor to talk to, right? His nephew Orodreth, right? His poor scarred nephew Orodreth, who will see him and his his uh, love affair with uh, the 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 human woman, right? And he Orodreth has already done the like crossing boundaries with romance, right? He in marrying the Cinda that he married earlier on, right? So he's already kind of done that. So he. Th- this it makes it easy for Ordreth to be all like, come on, Uncle Ignor, right? Go for it, right? Why are you holding back? And then Ignor can be explaining like, no, like this can't happen. We're not going here. Um, yeah, great. Okay, now Rihanna is asking an excellent question. If Glaurung is going to kill Ignor and Angrod's already dead, then who will the Bragalock Balrogs kill? The mm. answer to that yeah. is... We shall cross that bridge when we get to the Dagmar Dragon. <laughs> it is only season four. Um, uh, if we have to kill off somebody else, we can always kill off somebody else. We've got plenty of characters to dispose of in various places. Um, and we will decide, and I think my, my sense is, we have not even really scratched the surface of Ignor's uh, story. I don't really even myself yeah. yet have a clear sense of like what his character is. Like, what's he like? What's Ignor's personality? I don't even know. We've done nothing with him yet, right? So once we tell Ignor and Andreth's story in uh, uh, in season five, right? I think his death scene will come clearer to us. Do we want it to be a Glaurung death? Do we want it to be a Balrog death? I don't feel like a, we can we can make that decision right now. So if it's a Balrog death, then we're good. If not, then we'll have to kill somebody else. But also, don't forget, we'll have humans then too, right? So we'll have named <laughs> humans a plenty to kill off. Um, so, so uh, yeah, th- there will be no lack. Uh, we will not be uh, having to cast about for corpses uh, in the Dagor Bragalak. Um, so. Uh, and I agree so with Angrod. Rhiannon that Angrod doesn't need to die for us to focus on Ignor's character, but I'm saying it can only help, basically. Um, and I, but, and I, again, I do think the folk, uh, Angrod has been a major character, especially building up through you know through this moment, right? And with with what happened with Evelos and stuff, I mean, he's going to be a major point of emotional focus for our viewers. We, we've asked that of our viewers to this point, especially with the reveal with Ethelos that we were doing there in episode nine. Um, if we then expect, if we're then asking viewers to say like, but now pay no attention to Angrod. It's is all about Ignor, right? It's, it's not impossible. I, I, it just doesn't. Yeah, but it just doesn't. I mean, with Ethelos, I mean, the way that we kind of sketched it last week is during the Aglareb 
you know, Athelas does her thing. And Angrod, as a result, goes through that, you know, goes Fey. I mean, he just, it's like, it's like he just basically loses it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. If you keep him alive, you know, and I, so if he doesn't lose it and you keep him alive, I mean, I just don't know. He's just going to waste away into nothing. I mean, we're going to concentrate on Agnor Yes. Going forward, because we need to tell his story so that the Andreth story becomes something that the re- re- uh, viewers are really engaged in. It, Agnor just becomes a, a footnote. We don't we don't want Agnor to be a footnote. He, we need Angrod. We don't want Angrod to be a footnote. We right. want him to be. We want his. You know, we want him to go out with fireworks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and this is I mean? and this is I think the best time for him to go. I mean, especially since this is also I mean, it, with his between his wife and the business with the ban, right? Uh right. and the you know, right. this I mean, this is kind of the end of his arc, really. I mean, he's there's this, you know, and so it it makes sense to let's take him out of the top of his game, you know. Yeah, um, right. right. Uh, when like he is mac when he he has been maximally relevant, right? Uh it seems like the, I, I I agree to 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 have him just kind of fade into a uh, um, fading into a minor character seems anti like anti climax for him. And uh, Rihanna and I absolutely do think that we do want Ignor's character to some extent shaped by the death of his brother. Um, if he is stepping into a you know a mantle of leadership that his brother has left behind um, now as sole ruler of Dorthonian, um, he is going to be in a different. But that's going to make him in a different position. If he's now like taking in. Uh, you know, his nephew or a dreth, right? And trying to comfort him. So he, he now has this like quasi parental responsibility. He now has this as uh, a kingly responsibility there in Dorthonian. Um, that, that's inevitably, apart from his personal grief, it's definitely going to shape him, right? Um, and it gives him all kinds of, yeah, you're right, we don't any longer have, you know, his brother there to be like, okay, I ignore, don't. Uh, don't get carried away, you know, with like this human chick because like, you know, now's not the time for it. Right. Um, no, we don't have Angrod to tell him that anymore, but I think it's a much more compelling to have that coming from him, especially under these new circumstances. We could even, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a speech in which I ignore tells Andreth, you know, like maybe, you know, maybe if my brother were still alive, mm. uh, you know, maybe that, you know, maybe I could convince myself that I could run away um, and we could be together for the rest of your life, right? Uh, brief though that is, right? Um, uh, but, you know, but now there's no, you know, but but even, even, even if that were the case, it wouldn't be right. And now it's certainly not. Um, uh, it's certainly not okay. Anyway, um, so, so that's, that's, um, uh, yeah. I, so I definitely think that it can it can it can uh, it can work. Um, yeah. Okay, um, we have an hour to do seasons ten, it's, uh, episodes ten and eleven. Well, <laughs> if we get to eleven, we'll see about that. But <laughs> I, I wanted to. This is important Sorry. stuff. This yeah. is important stuff to think through. Uh, and uh, and actually, I, I've, I've been I've I've been confessedly kind of uh, uh, indulging in thinking about. Um, uh, I ignore a little bit more. Um, so, uh, how will Angrod's death affect other characters besides I ignore Rihanna? And is that's an excellent question. And Hey, you know how we can answer that question in the context of episode 10, um, there you go. where we're I thinking like about dealing with the ban in particular. Cause remember Angrod was an instrumental part in the ban. Um, you know, it was his testimony, right, that directly led uh, to the, you know, he was the one who, like, you know, there finally spilled the beans, uh, confirmed the things, uh, and was standing there in the room when Fingal delivered the ban. Um, Angrod is now dead, um, which puts Finrod and Fingolfin... Um, so like what is what is what is the impact one impact so he was we had depicted Angrod as the 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 primary hothead of the non Feanorian Noldor um that has been his role ever since before the crossing of the Helcaraxa um so um 
that's that element is gone now. Um, I wonder what impact Angrod's death would have on the Feanorians. I mean, Carinthir might not care because Carinthir despised him anyway. Um, I'm trying to think, would it, would it affect good riddance? their compliance? <laughs> Sorry, oh, uh, Hakan, I think, Hakan, you must be up very early and just joined us in time for me to say now that Angrod is dead. So if you missed like the entire hour's discussion of the death of Angrod that we've been having, I, I'm sorry, Hakan, that you came in at that point. Uh, but um, anyway, yes, I know it's 5 a.m. for you over there, Hakan. That's what I consider very early. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, wow. okay. Yeah, so again, sorry about that. We, you'll have to get the recording. We, we talked about it He's a so lot. calm. He goes, oh, Angrod's dead? Well, that's sad. <laughs> yes, it, it is sad. Absolutely sad. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, sorry, Oakwig, I missed that point. Uh, uh, Oakwig is pointing out that the Balrogs can kill Hador, uh, Goldenhead, uh, in the Dagor Bragalock. They absolutely could, Oakwig. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, but anyway, okay, sorry. All right. Um, Yeah, so I agree, Marie, that Mithros would, you know, he's the one of the Thanorians most focused on collaborating with the others. He will see the loss of Angrod as a weakening of their leaguer, right? Um, he will know that Ignor is not going to be as strong without him. I mean, Angrod was was uh, not just a hothead in the sense of being intemperate, um, but he was he was he was strong. He was a strong uh, warrior and a strong leader. And although Carinthir didn't get along with him. Um, I think that, you know, Mithros would certainly have respected him. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, Rhiannon, that's just exactly the direction I was thinking. Rhiannon says if Angrod were still alive, um, he might have been one of the reasons the Feanorians were less willing to accept the ban. That's just what I was thinking, that it might be a little bit easier for the in in the absence of Angrod and especially with his very recent tragic death, right? I mean, the discussion of the ban will be coming right on the heels of the end of the battle and the death of Angrod, um, and so uh, any impulse that the Fanorians might have had to be resentful and blame Angrod for bringing about the ban, like that tooth has kind of been pulled a little bit by Angrod's death. Right, so I do agree, Rhiannon. It kind of maneuvers the fa like it. It makes it harder for the Feanorians to be outraged in some ways. I think. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, I don't know that it's. Uh, I mean, obviously we can't be too extreme with that, but um, uh, but I think. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So. Okay, but let's let's uh, let's look at more broadly. Episode ten, of course, is going to be really important. Right? The warriors of Doriath show up ten minutes late with Starbucks. Did we miss anything, guys? Um, absolutely. So they show up, and it's a little awkward. Who's there? Mablong and Beleg, our standard warrior complement. Is Celeborn there? I'm thinking yes. I'm thinking yes. Uh, um. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I Kelborn, think you should be. Beleg, Mablon, um, are leading the Doriath folks. Thingol has stayed home, which is by itself a bit of a non-committal gesture on his part. Um, in addition to the tardiness of his forces, so their their tardiness and the awkwardness, which is super interesting, of course, because it recapitulates something that happened in season three, but it flips it around. Remember, in season three, we had the elves of Doriath, and then the dwarves showed up late, right? And they were like grumble, 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 and now they're the ones showing up late uh, and are being grumbled against. So that's a kind of an interesting reversal. Um, um, Oh, uh, Hakan, about the defeat of the Balrogs, we actually didn't talk about that, but I don't have to talk about that long. The Balrogs can withdraw. Like, once the once the armies of the orcs are surrounded and, and like, you know, the Balrogs are looking around and they see the orcs are going to be crushed around them, um, they, they're going to they're going to withdraw. 
um, and the and the rest of the and the and when the and the Balrogs withdraw and the orcs flee and the orcs are then like hunted down across the plain as described in the text. Like that all seems perfectly, uh, perfectly fine. Um, okay. Anyway. Uh, all right, so let's again let's carry on looking at the summary of what happens in episode two. And we've got Fingolfin accepting Thingol's ban. So we're going to have a kind of a summit meeting on the spot, right? Um, at Minas Tirith, I assume, which we're not calling Minas Tirith, right? At the Tower of Card, um, where is is presumed. I mean, that's like the besieged city that has been delivered by the battle, and so that's where people are going to be showing up. So we're going to be in Minas Tirith, um, and we'll have everybody there, right? Uh, 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 Mythros will be there. Fingolfin will be there. Targon will be there. Um, obviously, Fingrod is there. It's he, he's hosting the, the the place as well as then the folks from Doriath uh, who are also showing up. So, so okay, great. So we've got everybody there in Minas Tirith, and while we're here, we're going to have this sort of summit meeting, right, um, where we're going to be talking about the ban. Fingolfin is going to accept it and direct the Noldor to cease the use of Quenya in the presence of the Sindar and remove their gems from their clothing. Um, are we going to have a visit to Belagost? Um, Mithros commissioning Narsil from Telkar. That needs to happen somewhere around here. Um, uh, Okay, right. Yeah. So are we going to are we going to are we going to have this happen in Belgos presumably afterwards, obviously after the summit meeting. Um Ignor Arthel and Fingen visit Himring. Ignor receives Narsil as a gift from Mithros. Um uh we had talked about that meeting uh a while back when we were talking about the dwarves and Narsil in particular. Um uh, you know, we needed to invent the the the, the history of uh, of Narsil and we had decided that we wanted to give it to Ignor. Which is great. And by the way, what a wonderful opportunity to deliberately shift the spotlight, right? Episode 9 ends with Angrod's horrible and tragic death by Balrog, right? Then in episode 10, the sort of mantle is passed in this visible way, right, by the gift from Mithros of Narsil. So Ignor receives the special sword uh, from Mithros and kind of, you know, takes up his position like, I am the guardian of Darth or Darthonian. Mithros is like, hey, neighbor, right, you're the one who is like next to me in the line of defense and I'm going to give you this sword and like, you're now the man, Ignor. Um, um, so I really love actually how that kind of all flows together. Um, the Siege of Angman is officially established, right? So one of the things I think this should be a, uh, a, a, a discussion, obviously, in the uh, summit meeting, right, uh, at, at, uh, at Tulsirion. Um, the Noldor have been working towards this goal, but now it's put into effect. Um, I'm thinking, by the way, that could even come about almost as a kind of diplomatic compromise, right? Fingolfin... Fingolfin has a, a goal, right? I mean, he has a pretty quick... He, he emerges from the Dagor Aglareb with his shining vision of the defensive frontier, right? The, the, his shining vision of, like, the quarantine of evil in Middle-earth, right? We can contain it. We can keep it locked up here in the north. You know, can we break in and, dis, you know, defeat it for good? I'm, I'm not sure, but we can keep it locked up. We have shown... That, you know, this battle proved that if we work together, um, you know, even the armies of Morgoth and his Balrogs are not are not going to overthrow us. Right. Um, and but he knows he knows when he hears about the ban and he's there, you know, he's talking to, to, to you know, Kelborn and Mablong and Belag are sitting right there. Right. He knows if we're all going to actually work together, if this is going to be a full team effort, I have to compromise. Right. And so it's one of the things that influences him to um, uh, to accept the ban um, that anyway, that seems kind of logical to me that that would factor in to Fingolfin. Um, uh, we need to come back and think about the ban a little bit more in a minute here. Uh, that's obviously a major issue in this uh, episode. But thinking in the context, that certainly seems to work to me. And then, of course, the two other issues. Uh, the dreams, right? Olmo's dreams coming to Finrod and Turgon, warning of the doom of the Noldor and the need for safe, secret strongholds. And we need to... Now, 
episode 11, if I'm recalling correctly, is when they're going to actually start building them. So uh, let me just ask for clarification. Uh, uh, Nick and Marie and Rihanna and, if, and, and Hakan, if you guys remember, um, what is the is the goal to have... I know that the, the secret strongholds are going to begin concrete preparations in episode 11. Like we're going to see them like you know, uh, Turgon is going to be like finding Tomb Laden, right? And 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 beginning to be like, oh yeah, I'm picturing, you know, city on the hill in the middle of the valley. Um, so that's going to be happening in episode eleven. But are we going to? Have, so we have two options here. It seems to me, one is to have them, like we could end the episode with the visions, right? They receive the message of Olmo in the end, but we don't yet like have. My, they're not quite sure what to do with it yet. Episode 11 could contain not only the concrete beginnings, but also the discussion, or we could make the discussion part of this. Like, we know that Finrod and Turgon are going to go different directions with their application of Olmo's dream, right? Both of them receive the message, but they take it quite differently. Um, we're, they're going to have to talk about that, right? They're going to have to talk about that. Do we want the talking about it? And their different interpretations of what of fulfillment of almost warning looks like in this episode or next episode. I think next episode. Um, yeah, Nick, I agree with you again. Look at this, right? Oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, I think we have the dreams now and we do, and I would put the dreams towards the end of this episode and then we can have the, we can have the discussions of them in the next episode leading to which as a way of building up to the, discoveries of the locations in the beginning of the in the beginning of the thing um okay yeah yeah that um that uh, that 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 worked for me so that for as far as episode 10 is concerned all that would be needed would be the dreams themselves the visions however exactly we want to accomplish that um and of course the other issue then is the creation of glaurung um at least kind of teasing the fact that morgoth's response to the Dagor Aglareb is going to be, you know, upping his game in this particular, not just more orcs this time, you know, we're back, but this time with more orcs, but, uh, but the creation of Glaurung itself. Um, and the suggestion was that the Glaurung project be referred to obliquely, um, with, uh, no overt hint that Morgoth is creating a dragon, just something suggesting that, um, uh, uh, the R and D department is at work. Um, okay. All right. So let's think about this. With that last one, I'm not really sure. I'm uh, I'm a little torn about that. And honestly, hey, I'm hey they could nickname they could nickname a Glowworm Project Fat Boy. <laughs> 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 Wasn't that one of the names of the projects when they were doing the? Um... <laughs> The uh, nuclear bombs was a fat boy, one of them. Fat man, yeah, so, yeah. Fat man. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Thanks for Fat man. Yeah. <laughs> that would be misleading, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Which I think is the intention of a code name. Right. That's right. Exactly. That's exactly. Right. That's right. Um, no, I just mean misleading to the modern audience who who thinks we're giving them yeah, a hint about true. what's coming. That's true. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Um, Anyway, as you were, I've totally taken you off track. Sorry. That's okay. Um, all right, Hakan has an interesting question. Does Turgon commission Glamdring to be made before moving to Gondolin or in Gondolin? I think in Gondolin. I agree. I think in Gondolin. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, Hakan, here's, here's an idea. Here's an idea. What if Turgon has a because we know that Turgon does this kind of thing, right? What if he has a foreseeing, right? What if he has, you know, one of those moments of foresight, which comes upon him occasionally and came upon his wife more often. Um, and he sees, we have concealed ourselves in this valley, uh, but, you know, I, I will be going to battle again. Like, he knows that he is going to have to go into battle again. Like there is a great battle that he is still going to fight in. So in other words, we use the forging of Glamdring to, for foreboding of the near Nithar Noidiad. 
right? Um, so, because then, of course, once he has fought in the near night Thornoidiad and come home, then he might think that he's done, right? And he hangs Glamdring up above his mantelpiece, just like Bilbo hangs Sting up above his mantelpiece, and uh, everything's fine. Um, so yeah, so he so he will have this foreboding. So we'll have this scene somewhere in episode or season six or whenever it is, uh, seven or whatever, in which he you know has this foreboding and has the sword made. Okay, great question though. All right. Uh, okay. So the two primary. So we we're we're, we're talking about three locations, right? Possibly four if we're going to do a little inside Angband teaser. Um, yeah. Oh, and yeah, Murray, you're right. We, it will give us the opportunity to show the Gondolindrum developing technology the the other Noldor don't have. That's interesting. Sure, sure, like it. Okay. So we've got three scenes. We've got Tol Sirion. Uh, we got not just three scenes in the you know plot sense, but three locations, right? Tol Sirion, the summit meeting at Tol Sirion at the beginning, Himring, right, uh, with uh, Narsil and uh, uh, and and that business right in the middle, and then the dreams. Uh, the way it's described in the book uh, is that um, the way it's described in the book is the two of them are together, like they're 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 out hunting together, right, and they both have this vision, but they don't talk about it, like they don't neither one of them realizes that the other one had the vision too, right? And so they remain, you know, they remain silent, pondering the vision in their hearts and they never speak about it. And so therefore don't even know that the other one has also had this same vision. Um, we, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Rihanna and I love your doggedness. Uh, Rian is not going to declare defeat. She's like, Finrod can talk about his dream to Angrod. You know, he totally could. Um, I've got a better idea, Rian. And how about he goes and he, he goes to Angrod's gravesite and tells him about it? How about can we compromise? That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so, yeah, now, of course, this is not to say that they're never going to tell anybody. Obviously, they are going to tell people about this. We know that Finrod is going to get help from Thingol, right? Um, uh, for instance. Uh, and we know that uh, Turgon is going to tell somebody. His sister, right? Arathel, who's going to come with him. Uh, so, um, and that, by the way, one of the things that I think... Um, uh, one of the things that I think... Oh, uh, Halkan, we, we, we disposed of Oradreth by having the newly orphaned Oradreth living with Ignor at first, before the Dagor Bragawak, when, at which point Ignor's house is going to become distinctly less commodious. Uh, so he's going to hang out with Ignor, putting Ignor also in this kind of quasi, like, like in loco parentis, right, with, uh, uh, with Oradreth, who's an adult, by the way. But anyway, still, it's, it's his nephew. Um, and... Um, uh, and anyway, then he, um, uh, uh, but then of course after, you know, so, so Oradreth escapes from the wreck of, uh, of, of Dorthonian and that's when he, like Finrod takes him in. And by that time, uh, of course this like, you know, Oradreth is like, got like multiple layers of PTSD all piled up. Right. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, so yeah, oh good. So yeah, we've had him hanging out at, at with Finrod at Minas Tirith for a while. Great. So it'll be like going home, right? It's all it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. Okay. So, um, so yeah. No, Nick, I'm not making light of PTSD. Oradreth is going to be a really good opportunity to show. I mean, people have been talking about um, the uh, the 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 you know the trauma, like the trauma that the elves have experienced, and and like what with. And in Oradreth, we have an opportunity there, really, to show uh, it's going to be a major plot feature by the time we get to Turin and when we get to the Sons of Fanor and we get to Kurufin and Caligorm uh, in Nargothrond, right? Uh, or Oradreth's character is going to be really shaped uh, by these events here. Um, okay, anyway. Um, uh, 
And I know that you can have trauma without PTSD. I'm just suggesting that I, I, I think Oradreth is a really excellent candidate for PTSD. And uh, especially with what we are now putting him through. Um, uh, so um, anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Rihanna said Oradreth can talk about his PTSD with Angrod. <laughs> Rihanna, I can see this is going to become like a meme for the rest of the season. <laughs> right. Um, but they could have talked about it with Angrod. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. So... I like the fact that we already have a fairly organic um, separation of characters here, right? We've got Ignor, Arthel, Fingen, and Mythros, right, off at Himring. So after the after the um, the uh, uh, summit, right? After the summit, we've got, of course, the the Doriath folks go back to Doriath, which is important because Celeborn's about to get engaged, right? That's going to be happening in episode 11. So uh, th drama in Doriath is is uh, is going to be one of the primary uh, plot lines of episode 11. So we're going to send uh, we're going to send them back. Finrod, of course, is going to be involved as well. Post dream there. Um, so Doriath, you know, so we send them back to Doriath. These guys go back to Himring with Mithros. And then, and Torgan and uh, uh, and Finrod go hanging out together, and they're already on the Syrian, so they don't have to go far down the Syrian, right? They have to be somewhere near the River Syrian uh, in order to have their visions, and that is just to hand, as they are there in Tol Syrian. So that's certainly very, very easy uh, to um, orchestrate. Okay, um, and um, all right. I don't think we need to go all the way to Belagost. The commissioning, well, the problem is if we, I was just going to say the commissioning of Narsil could, um, uh, the, 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 the commissioning of Narsil could just be sort of described by my, when they, when they get to him ring, right. Mithros could be like, Oh, Hey, look at this sweet sword. You know, I had it made, you know, by Telkar the Smith, and they're like, who? And he's like, dude, she's awesome, right? Um, so we could easily do it that way. The problem is, of course, this, we, I think, weren't we originally planning to do this scene in part to, like, give, weren't we going to give Telkar some screen time here, right? And really wanted to emphasize, like, the legend of of Telkar and, and what a big deal she is. So maybe like downplaying it and, and putting that in exposition is not perhaps the way we want to go there. Um, but I'm not sure I, I can't, you know, he's going to want to have commissioned it already. Right. Um, I mean, I think when they get there, we're not going to want to have too many scenes with them there. Right. So I think they're going to want to get there and then he's going to have the sword and he's going to present the sword, uh, uh, to I ignore. Um, so, uh, doing, doing the dwarf stuff, seeing the inside of Belagost would be great. There is some function to that as well, right? Um, in that we're an episode before Nargothrond, right? Uh, Finrod isn't here, right? Finrod hasn't even had his dream yet, but it's an anticipation, right? Having seen the inside of Belagast will be a little bit more uh, sort of prepared for like, you know, we're walking around, uh, you know, Nargothron and being like, oh, I can see that, you know, we're going to have all this knocked through and then uh, it's going to look great just like Belagast. Um, uh, again, at least for, for the uh, for the viewers, I think that would that could be pretty compelling. So... Um, it's not that I don't like the idea. I do. I'm just trying to think how we manage it. Because my my fear is that we'd have to do a bunch of... Exp I mean, so we, what, have the summit? And then we do, like, a cutscene to Telkar at the Forge in Belagost, right? Like, okay, like, what's going on and why are we cutting to this? Wouldn't it kind of seem like we would need a lot of narration in order to not leave people just sort of puzzled by that cut um 
Uh, yeah. So I'm fine, uh, Nick, with just having Telkar coming to deliver the sword. Having her there in person in Himring and part of that discussion is certainly enough of an opportunity to spotlight her personally, right? And her role and the respect that the Noldor give her as a craftsman, right? So we can accomplish all that stuff um, by having her show up um, per personally. But but we don't accomplish the glimpse of the inside of Belagost, which I do agree could sort of become um, cool. Um, <laughs> Hakan, are you suggesting comedy there? <laughs> we see Telkar at the forge and like one of her apprentices comes in and is like, Master, what are you doing? And she's like, making a sword for a one-handed elf, right? You know, like the, the, the elf with no hand wants a sword, so I'm making him a sword. Um, I, I'm not suggesting you were necessarily thinking of that being comedy, but, uh, but I, I, I'm not saying I don't like it, actually. Um, but um, anyway, uh... <laughs> Rihanna says Angrod could visit Belagost. You know, Rihanna, it's going to be a while before that stops being funny for me. I don't know about anybody else, but I think it's hilarious. Um... <laughs> anyway... Um, uh, we could follow her back, Telkar, I mean, without elves. Um, but if she's already made Narsil, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Being there at the forging of Narsil is kind of awesome, right? I mean, like, there's a lot to like about the fact that we depict the forging of Narsil, right? Um, uh, even if we, even if only because um, we could then like juxtapose Narsil's forging of of uh, of Narsil, which we've already shot, right, with the reforging uh, of Anduro, uh, you know, in the in you know in the Third Age. I mean, anyway, there's a lot to like about showing Narsil being forged. Um, so. Um, we could, <laughs> we could, uh, we, c we could, we could open the episode with it. What if the very first scene of the episode is, and then it would need less explanation, right? Um, because it would be explained later in the episode. Like we just have this like no dialogue scene in which we show Telkar at the forge, uh, you know, holding up the sword, which we won't even know the significance of yet, right? And then so when she shows up later in the episode, um, then uh, and and presents Narsil, then like the earlier scene is explained, and then of course everybody then is like, ooh, that's really cool. Um, but, Marie, he can already have commission. I mean, it can turn out that he did commission it a while back. Like, the actual act of commissioning the sword needn't be something that we depict, right? Um, it just, you know, it turns out that he has. It, you know, it didn't get there in time for the first battle, turns out, right? But, um, uh, yeah. Um, what if... I remember that our original rationale was that Ignor was going to break his sword and need a replacement and so Mithros commissioned it. But under the with the with this flow of events, especially again if we if we're going to have if we if we wanted to start the episode with that little teaser scene, um <clears throat> we could change that. Um Ignor wouldn't have to break his sword. What if this is just like cuz again now especially in the context of the death of Angrod, um this now becomes like again this sort of passing of the torch thing, right? Mithros's official sort of it would be a significant gesture to Ignor, um, you know, in this uh, in this moment, um, to uh, 
uh, t- you know, to show him that, you know, to kind of build this relationship between the two of them now that, you know, he is the, you know, now that he is king and Dorthonian. Um, it seems to me like it, it could work well enough there for him to present this sword to Ignor. What if he originally planned to use the sword himself and he um, gives it up to Ignor? Like, this is like a gesture of solidarity of approval you know it's it's uh you know so telcar just shows up and she's like you know hey mr one-handed elf i have the awesome pimped out sword that you ordered right and Mytheros is like awesome thank you i've been looking forward to this but now i think i'm gonna give it to ignor because he's a man who looks like he needs an upgraded sword um um uh, yeah um Yes. Yes, Nick, we do rather need to decide whether the sword is one or two handed, don't we? Uh, would that be an idea of like a dwarvish practical joke to show up with a two handed sword for the one handed elf? Um, and uh, Mytheros, if you have a little trouble with this two handed sword, I could also fit you with a very handy prosthetic. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah. No, exactly. So it's I, I, I think it's I think it's fine having it be I, I, I I'd always in I'd always imagine Nandural being a one handed sword anyway. Uh so I have no problems at all making Narsil a one handed sword. Uh so that's fine. Yeah, Chris Graham points out that we're doing a lot of forging in this episode. Um forging the sword, forging the ban, you know, forging the you know the the and the ban through the ban, like the you know, the the the, the peace and the league right among uh, all of the elves including Doriath right um you know so so the siege is is forged and uh, in a sense Glaurung as well um yeah for, forging alliances i mean the forging could be a thing though the dreams don't really fit in with the forging so much i don't know anyway but yeah no, i i like it that all that all works pretty well together okay so i'm pretty cool with that um uh, it's a gift for Mythros, but then he gives it on to Ignor, and this just shows how awesome Mythros is. Mythros would also be moved by pity, I think, for Ignor, who's just lost his brother. Um, um, yeah. Maybe in Ignor, he sort of, I mean, uh, you know, he lost his kid brother before, right? So maybe he's, you know, this is his, like, uh, you know, gesture to sort of, you know, in his own mind, kind of take Ignor under his wing, you know. Um, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, okay. That's all good. And the dreams... The dreams are pretty simple. I don't even know that we need to talk much about the dreams. The dreams... They have a dream. I think they have the same dream. I think they should have precisely the same dream. And the interesting thing is that they take the precisely the same dream in different ways, right? Um, and if the dream is identical, then it uh, it gives us like it gives us more fuel to sort of show what the two different characters are making of it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, so that's simple enough. Do we want to show the dream? Or do we want to... I think we have to because they're not going to talk about it. So if they just wake up and have a dream that they don't talk about, it's going to be a little hard to cue the viewers in on that on that point, right? If we don't try. So I think we have to show it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, ooh, that's interesting. Marie says it's even possible the audience doesn't know which of them has the dream. Um, so we just show the dream and then we show them waking up and we don't know who had the dream and maybe they don't even find out until episode 11 that they both had it. Um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that. Because no, they cannot talk. both talk about their dream with Angrod in this episode, <laughs> Rihanna. <laughs> that's, not, that's not okay. All right. Uh, let us... Uh, let us close up by going back to the band because we, I deliberately skipped over that because it's the hardest part. So let's go back to it now. Having worked out the rest of the episode, let's go back to the band um, and the summit meeting there at Tulsirion. So, um, awkward moment when uh, the Doriath folks show up. Um, 
I think it's awkward. And although some, Karin Thier suggests himself as an obvious candidate, uh, would probably say rude things um, and cast aspersions on the lateness uh, of... Um, uh, of the elves of Doriath, I think most of them honestly will be relieved, right? I mean, somebody has to say during episode nine, like, you know, Thingol isn't coming. Thingol isn't coming. Um, they, they'll be happy about the fact that Cirdan does come and help with the other orcs that are coming in along the coast, right? Um, uh, Cirdan does help. Uh, so it's not like the, you know, the, the, the Sindar play no role uh, whatsoever. But um, but again, I think the very fact that it, even though it comes too late, the fact that the elves of Doriath did come is going to be very encouraging, especially to Fingolfin and, and Finrod. Um, and so I would think that although there will be some grumbling, um, uh, and do you guys have any objection to my beating on Karanthir here again? Do we want a second jerk? Do we want Kelligorm to get his shot to be a jerk here? Do we want somebody else? To voice an opinion. Um, <laughs> sorry, Rihanna, and I totally set myself up for that one, right? Uh, Angrod could be angry <laughs> that they show up late. Okay, Kelligorm, Nicolex Kelligorm for this one. Okay, I mean we do need to we do need to establish that Kelligorm is is uh, um, you know outdone in jerkiness only by his brother Carinthir. So um, okay, so 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 we would have some mutterings. Kelligorm, I agree, a very logical candidate for the mutterings in question. And, oh, Nick agreed. Kelligorm is the one who is going to be uh, the one who's supposed to marry Luthien later on. Uh, so having Kelligorm be particularly despised uh, by the... I mean, uh, so, yeah, Nick, I'm imagining Mablung's reaction in particular when he hears the news about Kelligorm, that Kelligorm is the one who's going to marry Luthien by force, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, Marie points out that I ignore and I would add possibly Oradrath might be a little bit upset. Right. Um, uh, if you guys had come a little bit earlier, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, Angrod wouldn't be dead. Um, yeah, I, I love Kelligorm and the setting up of the Luthien business later on. Um, Agreed. Finrod is going to be diplomatic. I think Finrod and Fingolfin are going to be the two who are primarily diplomatic and be non-coincidentally, they are the two most focused on establishing the Uyghur and establishing the alliance, cementing the alliance among all the elves, achieving reconciliation. So this summit is a big deal. Notice, um, in a sense, this moment in episode 10, though this wasn't really how we were thinking about it in the shape of the season originally, this is a huge, this is like episode five, right? In episode five, we have the feast of, uh, you know, like the, 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 the Merith Adderthad, right? Uh, so we had the Merith Adderthad in episode five, and now we have this summit meeting, this sort of spontaneous summit meeting in episode 10. Um, those are the two moments, right, of like the gathering together of everybody into one place. Um, and um, uh, so the two of them kind of correspond to each other. Of course, the one is all of, is about weddings and partying. Uh, and this is about, you know, war and grief and resolution, you know, from, uh, in, you know, in the, in the wake of battle, right. With, you know, orc corpses still steaming down in the Valley. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So the ban. So who leads with the ban when they come to the table is Mablung like <clears throat> okay so sorry we didn't make it to the battle in time but let's talk about this ban right um, by the way clearly Kelligorm's grumbling is in Quenya right clearly um, I mean just to kind of like emphasize that right um, so How do we think it happens? Does do the elves of Doriath primarily bring it up, and then we see like Finrod and Fingolfin man trying to manage the reactions to it, or they've already heard about it. Finrod was there, right? So it's not like it's a news flash to them at this point. Do they bring it up? 
does Fingal is it just like the elephant in the room until Fingolfin steps forward and does his diplomacy thing and says, Hey, I'm um I'm High King of the Noldor and I'm um I'm High King of the Noldor and I say we accept this ban. Um Yeah, I mean he's the one who's gonna have the decisive acceptance of the ban speech, right? Um, for him to initiate it, I think might be really good. Because uh, I would think the whole thing would be real tense before that, right? Um, I mean, Yeah, that makes sense. He especially if Caligorm is speaking in Quenya, right? I mean, that's like a very awkward moment, right? Mablung, I would think because Mablung is the one who's really in the position of, like, who's really representing Thingol here, right? He's Thingol's right-hand guy. So, I think he looked furious when Caligorm is, is not only criticizing him, but criticizing him in Quenya. Um, yes. And so, exactly, Marie, Caligorm is kind of the definition of a kinslayer, unrepentant. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, ha, the the whole elephant in the room deal uh, and Caligorm's rudeness and uh, Mablung's fury and like it looks like this whole thing could fly apart, right? The results of this from a diplomatic standpoint could be really disastrous. And so um, Fingolfin steps in and Finrod is also the you know then supports him as you know the sort of moderator. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Hakan, I, I do agree. And yes, Chris, I do mean the Oliphant in the room. Absolutely. Um, uh, and so Hakan, I like the idea that Mablung should comment to Celeborn. Um, yes, yes. Celeborn should be the one to, uh, to receive that. And, you know, yeah, cause yeah, if Mablung is turning to Celeborn and saying, you know, saying something along the lines of, you know, look at these bloody arrogant Noldor, right? We have no use for them. And Caliborn's like, eh, awkward. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I think that that would go well. So then the whole thing gets diffused by Fingolfin with the assistance of Finrod. Is there anything else we need to accomplish at this summit? Other than that, the acceptance of the ban. We can also show, of course, the broad skepticism. I mean, Caranthir and Caligorm are not going to emerge happy and contented, right? And we can see plenty of evidence, like, you know, one of them turning to the other and speaking Quenya before they leave the room, right? Um, as an indic, you know, m maybe not like at the top of their lungs, right? But where they're not totally worried about being overheard uh, by uh, uh, by Mablung. Um yeah, yeah. You're right, Marie. Then we have we have to make military arrangements, right? Setting up the leaguer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the funeral of Angrod. Yeah. Did we decide about funerals? Did we decide what the elves do with dead relatives? I mean, we have a couple precedents for this, right? Um I don't recall us ever nailing down elf funeral We're rites. Not nailing it down. We talked about grief broadly, but we didn't yes. really talk about yeah, we, and and how well. weird and how weird the notion of grief is in this context. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we talked specifically about funeral rites, though. We keep, we keep going back to this topic, wrestling with it a little bit, yeah. realizing it's really well, hard. Finrod is running gonna... out of time. Moving on. Yeah. Finrod is going to be buried here too. I mean, Finrod is also going to die here at Tolsirion, right? Yep. I mean, like eventually when it's, you know, evil and stuff. Um, <laughs> Rihanna and I realize there's a way to avoid discussing Elvish funerals here, <laughs> but that's okay. It's worth the cost. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah. So I think mean, the clearest instance that we have is, you know, the, the barrow of Finrod, atop Tolsirian and the Barrow of Fingolfin um, uh, that Turgon builds. So I think Barrows and Cairns are, are kind of the way to go here. Um, so uh, 
so yeah, so having having like a mound for Engrod here on Tolsirion, um, you know, we can show Finrod and and Engrod's, you know, mounds sort of side by side here. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay, no problem. But I don't think we have a big funeral. I don't think we have a big funeral because. Yeah, I mean, if you think of the primary reasons that humans have funerals, very few of those apply to elves, right? You know, like, let's all celebrate the memory of Angrod. Like, their relationship with memory is different than humans, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, anyway... Um, we, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Indeed, we don't even have to show a ceremony. We could just show the mound of Engrod afterwards and, and you know, Oradreth and Ignor, you know, standing by it before we leave Talsirian here. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, it's true, Marie, thinking about the exile of the Noldor and them being uncertain about, you know, the separation means something a little different uh, to... Uh, uh, to the exiles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Chris, I don't like the idea of elves burning their dead. And I think the primary reason I don't like that is I want Feanor's, like the burning, the self-immolation of, of, of Feanor's corpse to look more weird, you know, like not, like a you know a normal burial ceremony a deviation from the norm um yeah yeah um we don't the only yeah i mean amrod's death as well hakan exactly was unnatural like uh amrod getting you know burned inside the ship is horrible Right in all in every way horrible, um, yeah. So no, I don't think so. Any, I mean, does anybody burn their dead other than like Denethor and the heathen kings that he was following, or whose tradition he claimed to be following? Um, the burnt dwarves in Moria, which is an, a, an exception, which proves the rule. Right, because they were like, this is a big like it was a it was a big deviation for them, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, there's not a whole lot of uh, burning. Exactly, Rian, and the corpse like Glaurung's corpse gets burnt. Um, exactly, yeah. Um, which again seems to be you know an exception, which proves the rule, right? You don't do that to the to the good dead. Um, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I don't, I, I'm, I, was, I was trying to think if I could think of any positive examples, like any examples of non sketchy burnings of the dead, right? Um, because there's certainly, you know, traditions in which, like, that's normal. So, um, you know, it wouldn't be hard to imagine, but I can't think of any examples in Tolkien's world. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's interesting, Marie, that thinking about Vikings, um, even there, Tolkien primarily focused on, like, funeral ships, right? Um, like, the corpses of dead heroes were, like, washing up on beaches in still intact ships, uh, you know, like in King Horn and stuff, which it's not a corpse, of course, it's a kid. But still, nevertheless, the point is... Um, yeah, Nick, exactly. You might think that the Rohirrim would burn their dead, but they don't. So, yeah, no, it's... it's um, And even, of course, the Barrow Downs suggest that, of course, the Arnorians didn't either, and we know the Gondorians don't. So, yeah, no, I can't think of any examples. I might be overlooking something, but I can't think of any positive examples. It doesn't mean we can't ever do it. It doesn't mean we can't have any cultures in which, you know, uh, ceremonial cremation is a normal and accepted part of their culture. Um, but I certainly don't think we want to go there with the, with the, um, uh, with the, the Noldor. Um, okay. 
Um, good. Hey, I think that works, right? Are we done with episode 10? Look at that. So we accomplished all of our, go- yeah, not all bad. our goals in this episode, except for episode 11. But uh, Except for episode 11. Let me just say, we spent the entire first hour talking about Balrogs and Angrod. So if not for the fact that we needed to revisit the Angrod and Balrog question, I am confident we would have accomplished both episode 10 and episode 11. Um, really, really the rest of you t- are to blame. Yeah, oh, exactly. Right. I'm, I'm absolutely shifting blame there. Uh, but no, it's all good. It's all good. And this puts us back on schedule, right, to do episode 11 and 12 together as we were originally planning to do. So there we go. Yes, we're, we we're go. back on schedule just one episode late. Which is pretty much the same thing as on schedule as far as we're concerned. So that's um, true. The plan is then that so next time our next episode will be on uh, uh, August 22nd, as I said, um, Thursday, August 22nd. Um, and we'll be disc- we'll be discussing the final creative content question and specifically on dragons. It's time for us to sort out. We've put off a bunch of dragon issues and dragon questions and we need to decide here. It's time for Glaurung to reveal himself. So we need to... Uh, Make sure we know what we're talking about here with dragons. And if there are any other topics or questions that people would want to talk about, happy to address those uh, in this uh, in this next episode there as well. Um, uh, and then, of course, in the following um, episode, the following session, we'll then talk about episodes 10 and 11. No, 11 and 12. We'll talk about episodes 11 and 12. We just talked about 10. Um, great, great. And the script episode for a discussion... The script discussion for episode nine uh, for the Dagor Aglareb uh, episode uh, will be tomorrow night. So you, whoa, so you guys are, oops, hang on a second. Here I uh, uh, lost myself here. Um, you guys are like right behind us here. That's pretty cool. Um, so, and then you'll, you'll be discussing episode 10, the one we just talked about tonight. Wah, I completely crashed my PowerPoint. Oh, well, easy come, easy go. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering that looked absolutely tragic there. Um, okay, so yeah, so we got so there will be two stri- script discussions uh, prior to the next um, uh, the next time that we meet uh, to discuss. So yeah, you guys will be all caught up with us. That's kind of uh, that's kind of incredible. Okay, cool. Well, thank you everybody for. Um, uh, for joining us here tonight um we will uh, as i said we'll be back to our <laughs> okay so there's good news and bad news as far as returning to the regular schedule is concerned the good news is that august 22nd we'll be returning to our regular schedule the bad news is we won't be able to meet two weeks after that because <laughs> there's another conflict <laughs> so we're gonna have to go off the schedule again immediately uh after uh after we meet so we either that we'll meet on the 22nd and the one after that will either be on the 29th or it'll be on, you know, September 12th or whatever. Um, anyway, we'll, um, we'll constant sort it chaos. Out. Yeah. We'll sort it out. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we will announce that next time. We know we are definitely going to be meeting on the 22nd. So there we go. All right. Um, Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight, and we will see you guys in three weeks. And to everybody we say, as always, thanks for listening, and Godspeed. All right. Another good one. Excellent. That was fun. Rihanna, you are such a good sport, and you are, you are, uh, you're, you're very funny. You're cracking me up with your Angrod comments here uh, tonight. That is, uh, um, uh, that was, that was really, really funny. So, um, and like I said, I honestly, Rihanna, I felt really bad. Like, I was, I totally, you know, I, when, when Marie alerted me to the fact that you guys had concerns, I'm like, okay, I, I can work with this already. And then I'm going through and I'm like, oh, man. I'm going to have to disagree with everything. And I really didn't want to. Uh, but there it was. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. All right. But anyway, so thanks, everybody. Thank you for all the, the work, as always, that you guys have been doing. Appreciate all your help. 
really excited about the uh, I've, I've heard really good things about the script discussions that you guys are having. I'm really excited uh, to see those uh, when we when we get there, um, uh, which is not long now. Right. We'll be in post-production before we know it. So uh, so that'll be really cool. Um, and also I saw I forgot to mention this. I went past it and then forgot about it. But I saw that Philip was talking about composing a new theme uh, j for the dreams. Uh, which is uh, which is great. I, I really look forward to that. So cool, excellent, excellent. Well, I am uh, I am very excited. So thanks everybody for joining us, and I will see you guys again on August twenty second. Of course, we don't see you earlier than that in another uh, in another broadcast somewhere else. So thanks everybody. Bye now. Bye. Although the theoretical budget of our hypothetical blockbuster may be unlimited, the production budgets of this and the rest of our fun alternative educational projects are unfortunately not. If you have enjoyed joining our production team, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.